morning to you, brothers and sisters. I do welcome you to our service, and I hope you would enjoy the message. Uh, I, I believe that God has something that he wants you to hear today in our business in this world, where we find with no time for just doing certain things, and we get worried so much. Let us uh, pray. Uh, today we are guests in a familiar home, Father, uh, with Mary and Martha and Jesus. We are invited to think about their hospitality and to be challenged about our own. What does it mean to be hospitable? What does God want us to be like in the company of one another? There are times to be busy and times to be still. There are times to give and times to receive. There are times to work for God and times to wait on God. May we bring to our worship attentiveness of heart and openness of spirit that we may celebrate the Lord's worship and the Lord's presence with us in word, song, and silence. Amen. Uh, I'll call my brother Ben to come and read the word of God from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Okay, thank you. Praise God. And uh, I thank the Lord for every single one of you this week. Uh, just know that he loves you so much. And um, that if you were the only person on the earth, he would have come for you. That's how much he loves every single one of us. Uh, as Johnson mentioned, Luke 38, uh, Luke 10, 38 to 42, praise God. It's about Jesus visits Martha and Mary. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparation that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Praise God. I get a bit distracted sometimes and it's so nice when we realise to uh, just sit at Jesus' feet. But anyway, we'll get uh, Johnson back to share his message that the Lord's put on his heart for us this week. It's going to be awesome as per usual. So let's get him back. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you. you know, there are certain things that uh, we need to prioritize from the story that has been re read uh, by Brother Ben, Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 42. And I've come up with a theme, when you are anxious and stressed about many things. When you are anxious and stressed about many things. We live in a complicated, anxiety-producing world. In our culture today, anxiety is one of the major ailments that people both suffer from and seek to relieve. We all know what happens when your body, mind, and spirit become afflicted with high anxiety. High anxiety can cause physical maladies, such as heart attacks, strokes, autoimmune disorders, eating disorders, and overloaded adrenaline glands, emotionally, Anxiety can throw us off balance, cause depression, makes us distracted and absent-minded. It can lead to unhealed obsession and addictions. Worry can make us grouchy, uh, snap and self-focused. It can even cause memory issues. Most of all, it can disrupt our sense of peace, being, peace, balance and wellness, so that we become our worst selves instead of being what we should do. B. Spiritual high anxiety causes us to turn our attention to ourselves and our own goals and importance instead of focusing on Jesus, on others, and what's truly important, our relationships. High anxiety is a disease of action. 
as though our whole being is running on a fast mode or stuck in one gear. Once caught up in it, it's hard to disengage. And uh, it has now brought a lot of people to a mental disease issue. It's because of high anxiety, unable to manage our anxiety. Often the causes of our anxiety come from where our internet goes. We have a paper due and wanted to get it on time and have waited a bit too long to do it. And now we are writing on a 48-hour page or uh, um, assignment. We have come and coming over and needed to get the entire house cleaned so it looks clean when the visitors arrive. Otherwise, what will people think when they arrive and see the dead house? We have too much pressure at work but want to prove we can handle anything and so refuse to ask for help. Not even refuse to ask for help. We, we, we don't even refuse other tasks. Come our own way. We take them all. We have shopping to do and kids take care of while you're trying to help a friend move. You know there are hundreds, thousands of reasons, often well-intentioned, that cause anxiety. The more pressure we put on ourselves to succeed and get something done in order to live up to our standards or a bursted by our inner critic, the more our anxiety grows. We are restless people obsessed with many things and certainly we are anxious about the many, these many things. We have even coined the term stress to describe our condition. I am stressed. I have seen people who are always stressed every day you meet them, you talk to them, they always utter this way, I am stressed. I am stressed. Stress may be killing more of us than AIDS. A lot of people are thought to have hypertension, although some of them don't even know they have it. Stress is frequently found as the major cause of respiratory infections, arthritis, colitis, asthma, and even heart rhythms many sexual problems, circulating problems, and even cancer. Stress takes a heavy toll on us. Even if our health is not at risk, certainly our peace of mind is not. So, breakdown happens when our ability to reach one of our self-imposed bars appears more and more elusive. The sense of order, completion, and sex and so forth that we have wrapped into our self-expectation begins to feel threatened. What happens? We begin not only to doubt ourselves, but we take our frustrations on everyone around us. That's when we have fallen into the trap of high anxiety. In a, high anxiety is a kind of self-imposed narcissism in which we become closed off to everything but our own focus. We try to do do and do in order to make things right. Or we, ask, we scream out in frustration about the unfairness of our situation. We always complain about unfairness in the home, everywhere, at work, with whoever we meet. We always suppose it's unfair. So, ironically, we brought it upon ourselves. And it becomes really difficult. Often those around us have no idea of the friends we have created within ourselves due to our own devices as they have no part and no way to begin. This is much the situation with Martha in our scripture for today. Martha is a girl. She had a vision. She had a purpose. She is on a mission. It's not a bad mission. It's not a bad mission at all. In Jesus' culture, hospitality is a great thing. When someone is welcomed into your home, especially someone important, well-known, like Jesus Christ, you want to put your best foot forward. You want to treat them well, make them feel pampered, especially give them your best. And this is what Martha was doing. As it is, Martha appears to be a fantastic cook. She is obviously a great project manager, a seasoned manager of others. She knows what it takes to pull off catering a large event style dinner. She's worked out in her mind who should do what in order to get all done. Anyone here ever went to prepare a large holiday dinner and a spouse or a friend 
adult child or a teen to run an errand for a missing ingredient, to go and pick an ice, to take something out of the oven. When you are engaged with something else, to help clean the house in anticipation of the guest arrival, almost everyone has experienced this one in, in, in a while. You have experienced when you are expecting someone coming to your house, you want it to look good. You run everywhere. But you also have got some expectations. Anyone get a bit annoyed when your significant other spends the entire time riffing and laughing and socializing with the guests, eating the appetizers, and relaxing on the couch when you need him or her to be helping you get your list of things done in time to save. You are expecting them to be running around like what you are doing. And they are sitting, watching the TV, laughing and doing all these things. And they are now worried, you know, mind to say, are, they, are these people okay? Does they understand what we are waiting for? Do they understand the situation? This is mother's situation. She is matron of the kitchen. She expected Mary to be an assistant chef. But Mary is otherwise engaged. The Greek translation of this story is interesting. It literally says that Martha was distracted about the service. She is in a position of serving. It's a goal and mission at this gathering to be the one who serves others. And yet she is terribly anxious. Again, the Greek text tells us, Jesus said, you are anxious and turbulent. She replies, my sister left me to save. What was Mary doing? The Greek text says, she sat by the feet of Jesus and heard his word. So the Greek text reveals something interesting things that we need to pay attention. She sat by the foot of Jesus. She sat by the feet of Jesus to listen to the word. First of all, serving is good. There's nothing wrong with serving. Martha is in a role of doing exactly what we believe a disciple of Jesus should do. Hospitality is very important. Save. The Greek word for save here is the same word used for ministry. All of you people who serve in the kitchens of the church hear this. Food service in the name of Jesus is a ministry. And it's very important. An important and vital ministry, but only if it is done in the spirit of service. If it is done in the spirit of service. What happens to Martha? Instead of evoking feelings of goodwill, grace, peace, and meaning for her to save Jesus, instead of feeling of the feelings of faithfulness, joy, love, and giving world inside of her, she feels instead high anxiety. Something is not good. She is focused not on the person she is serving, but on her own list of goals, the task, the timing, and the work to be done. She is not enjoying her ministry anymore. She is feeling that Martha has left her to do everything. Mary has left her to do everything. She sees it as a task to be completed. I don't know about you, but if I were a guest and the host was angry, and failed put upon by saving me, I think I would rather slink out the back door and just disappear and continue to wait for the meal. I can't continue to wait for the meal. What would you think? What would you do? Would you like to be saved by someone who is angry? Would you like to see someone who is saving you for the meal and you can see that there is tension here? I don't think that would be a good meal. That won't be. Martha has turned the beauty of hospitality into a post of duty. She has made a ministry about task and list instead of about intimacy, engagement, joy, and the kanban of Jesus. To be in the kanban of Jesus. Jesus is not scolding her for her service. She is not saying it's okay for Mary never to help in the kitchen or to take part in the service. She's simply saying that the most important thing of hearing the word, of sitting at the feet of Jesus, of being intimate, joyful in relationship with him, is the true goal of being a disciple. So sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the word of God, hearing what Jesus is saying, 
is the most important thing we need. Without this engaging with Jesus, our ministry becomes only self-serving and a burden upon ourselves. Only when our ministry evokes from our engagement and bonding with the person of Jesus, do we feel the joy, the peace, and true selfness that comes with the true discipleship, with the true service. True ministry comes from marinating in the presence of Jesus, not from the least we have. Here is the secret to say a successful, well-ordered life. Make sure you make your priorities in order. Listen very carefully. Maybe I can save your money on your next management seminar. Make sure your priorities are in order. Maybe I can help you sleep better at night because you know that everything is in, in position. Make sure your priorities are in order. I can probably save you a free trips to the doctor because you can visit the doctor and nothing you are suffering from beside anxiety. It's only anxiety that you are suffering from. Make sure your priorities are in order. This is the key to working smart as well as working hard. Make sure your priorities are in order. What are those things in your life that are real vital? Take care of those things. Then if the rest get done, fine. But it's no big deal. Martha wanted to be the perfect hostess. That is well and good. But the master was in her home. The master was in her home. He only had a short time to spend there. Martha had the opportunity to soak up ways that would enrich her life immeasurable. Certain the needs of a guest were important, but this was not the time. How foolish we can be when we do not keep life in its proper perspective. We become too busy with other things which are on the peripheral. I want to give you an example of a man called John Wesley. John Wesley realized this more than anyone after his heart woman experienced at Alders Gate. Wesley had done all the right things. He fed the poor. He visited the people in prison. He gave money to those in need. He did everything he felt he could, and yet his inner bar of approval was so high. He was constantly anxious. Wesley himself suffered from high anxiety until he finally realized, with the help from his friends, the Moravians, that his inner peace would never come from reaching his endless and impossible goals list, not from the excessive friends the schedule he tried to keep, but simply from his inner relationship with Jesus, in which he understood, and with his heart and with his redemption was a free gift that he had. So Wesley changed his tune after he felt John staring, uh, Jesus staring in his heart. He said and listened to the word of Jesus. He sat at Jesus' feet, allowing him to permeate in his heart, body and soul. And he left a new person. When his family noted the change in him, they inquired what happened. After all, Wesley has continued to do the same ministries of service. But what had changed is inside of him. Instead of doing them because he felt he had to do in order to obtain salvation, he was now doing them because he knew he had salvation. His service and joy of ministry grew out of the peace of his relationship with Jesus. He secured in Jesus' love and in his pure desire to love others the way that Jesus was loving him. So Wesley's personal uh, change sparked the spiritual revolution in his life. It was a spiritual revolution which became the Methodist revolution. And sometimes today, we too can become so busy with the work of the church, our post, our responsibilities, but we put so much stock in our positions of power and things that we need to be done for our ministries in, in our buildings that we lose the focus of discipleship completely. That focus must always be Jesus. Our focus should never change. It should always be Jesus. We are in the church in order to fulfill our list of things we want to do. We are here to be in a joyful and loving relationship with our Savior and Lord. We are here to sit at His feet and listen to the Word of God, to engage with Him intimately and peaceful and to revel in His life-giving presence. 
We need to be disciples of Jesus who are committed to sit at his feet, to listen to his words. Because that is very important. When that is what we do, our ministry will follow forth from there. Ministry of love, compassion, joy, and above relationship with those whose goal to is always to be close to Jesus. We have relation with others. You are not worried. Jesus' story of Martha, Mary and Martha is a vital for us today as it was then. The circumstances may change, but Jesus' message never changes. You are worried with many things, Martha. So his message never changes. If you are anxious about many things, it may be that your priorities are out of order. The thing, this brings us to the most important thing to be said in this regard. There is one priority that will make others easier. Spend some time each day with the master. Learn from Mary's example. Spend more time with the master. Take some time to sit at the feet of Jesus. That it can be done in reading daily from his ways in a time of meditation and prayer. Take time to pray. Take time to read the word of God. On your own, moments spent in this company will help you sort out the rest of your priorities. Particularly when life gets hard, time spent with the Him is essential. You need to spend time with Jesus. You need to spend time. Don't spend time with the list of things that you want to do. You and I are anxious about many things. We need to get our priorities in order. We too need to begin by setting aside a few moments every day to feed on the risen Christ, to feed on the master. We too need to spend some time each day looking into the face of Jesus. Not looking on the list of things that we need to do, but looking in the face of Jesus. Today, take stock of your own life and work. Do you suffer from high anxiety? Do you suffer from stress? Marinate in the joy of Jesus, the living water, and our eternal feast. That's where you'll find peace. You won't find peace anyway. You only find peace when you've got a relationship with Jesus Christ, who is the master, who is the savior of your life. He's the savior of the world. Give your time. Give your heart. Surrender your all to Jesus Christ. Maybe every day, in the morning, whatever time, surrender your life to Christ and say, it's all about you. It's nothing to do with me. May the good Lord help you as you continue to do your ministry and save others. Don't get anxious. Don't get stressed. Be happy. Be at Jesus' feet. Amen. Amen. God bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Forgive, Lord. Sometimes we are crowded hearts, minds, and lives filled with distractions that flatter and deceive, drawing us into ways and thoughts and actions that grieve, shame us, and hate others. Forgive that some crowdedness that draws us away from ways and thoughts and actions that will gladden you, honor us, and heal others. Help us, Father that we don't need to lose our focus. Our focus is you, Jesus. Let us put our priorities in order. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am calling you so that um, we can now put our offering together wherever you are all the details will come on the street on the screen well, on how you should do your offering I know these days it's so easy to do it and I'm asking you please when you hear the word of God and you are pushed by the Holy Spirit to do what you can it's time to make your thanksgiving offering may God bless you Amen, let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you for this special time. We thank you for all the gifts of life. We thank you that without you, we can't have anything. But with you, we have got everything. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. May you continue to bless us, Lord. May you continue to help us so that we know that you are the gift of everything. 
and that life is meaningless without you. So, Lord, we bring those things you have given us in return of saying, thank you, Lord, for what you have done to us. This is our thanksgiving offering. Father, bless it. May you continue to bless us from now and evermore. Amen. Let's receive benediction. Living God, we have gathered for worship and now scatter for service. We pray your blessings on all our days, in the quiet, in the noise, in the space, and in the crowdlessness, in the peace and conflict. We pray that we may make time and give room to hear and heed your voice and sit at your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. Amen.